The seven sages of ancient Greece were a revered group of wise men who wielded significant influence and were known for their roles as statesmen, lawgivers and philosophers. As pioneers of ancient Greek politics, these men emerged during the Archaic period, subsequently shaping and influencing the development of the Golden Age in the classical world. In later times, their wisdom was expressed in the form of popular maxims. Plato was the first to compile a list of the sages, influencing many such as Simonides, Herodotus, Diogenes and other later scholars to craft their own lists. These lists occasionally featured different names, however, the most acceptable and agreed upon list is the following. Bias of Priene, Periander of Corinth, Helon of Sparta, Cleobulus of Lindus, Pittacus of Mytilene, Solon of Athens, and Thales of Miletus. The accounts surrounding these figures blend elements of both legend and history, as the sources referring to them were compiled many centuries after their death. Therefore, it is probable that the stories of these sages contain exaggerations and inaccuracies. Bias was born during the late 7th century BC in the ancient Greek city of Priene in the region of Ionia. With his exceptional integrity and honesty, he established himself as a renowned lawyer and judge, earning a widespread reputation throughout Greece. Such was his reputation that when confronted with difficult decisions, many rulers would invoke his name. According to most sources, Bias was a rich man. At some point in his life, he got married and had a daughter. Apart from being a judge, Bias was also a poet. He once wrote a poem of 2,000 words for the region of Ionia in which he elaborated on how the region should be governed in order for it to thrive. Whether or not he ever assumed actual governing duties though remains unknown. Along with poems, he also wrote songs which were often sang at the symposiums of the time. The sources often mention how kind-hearted he was. It is stated that at one time, Bias came across a group of girls from Messini who had been taken captive after a war and were brought to Priene to be sold as servants. He bought them and raised them for a few years as his own daughters, educating them and providing them with a good dowry. Finally, when they reached adulthood, he sent them back to their families in Messini. Bias was also known for his cunningness. The writer Diogenes mentions that when the Lydians were laying siege to the city of Priene, Bias decided to fatten up two mules and after a few weeks he set them free outside of the city. When Aliates, the Lydian king, saw them, he was dumbfounded. He thought that if these mules were so well fed, then the people inside the city would most likely have an abundance of food and so he decided to send an envoy to the city. In order to trick the envoy, Beers filled a number of large jars with sand and placed a few wheat straws at the top. When the envoy returned to the camp, he told the Lydians that the people inside the city had amassed a supply of food capable of lasting for several months. And so, the Lydians abandoned the siege and returned to their homeland. Beers continued to work as a lawyer until the end of his life. One day, when he was really old, he was asked to defend someone at court. He accepted, delivered a great defense speech, and when he finished, he sat down and rested his head upon the shoulder of his grandson. The lawyer who defended the other man delivered his speech as well, and in the end, the judges voted in favor of the man who was defended by Beas. When the case ended, they found out that Beas had died quietly in the arms of his grandson. He was then given a great funeral where people from all over the land gathered to mourn his loss. Upon his grave was the following inscription. Beneath this stone lies Vius, the son of the famous Prianian land, the glory of the Ionians.
Chilon, son of Demagetus, was born around the late 7th century BC in the city of Sparta. Not much is known about his early life. Chilon was a man of few words, however, he became known for his wisdom, honesty and his laconic wit. As he grew up, the Spartans started to take notice of his exceptional intellect. Over the years, he gained the respect and admiration of his co-citizens and around 560 BC, he was elected ephor of Sparta. The ephors were a group of five magistrates who, together with the two kings of Sparta, formed the main executive wing of the state. Every adult male citizen was eligible for election. When Kilan's brother wondered why he himself wasn't elected, Kilan replied to him, It is because I can be patient in the face of injustice, while you cannot. The greatest achievement that is attributed to Kilan is his legislative reforms. By reducing the power of the two kings and enhancing the authority of the ephors, he achieved a balance between the two institutions. From then on, the ephors had a much bigger say in laws, religious matters and military operations. Furthermore, the ephors would make sure that the kings obeyed the laws of the state. Aside from a legislator, Kilan was also a poet. He mainly wrote elegiac poems as well as didactic ones or poems of moral instruction, the main subject of which was self-control and prudence. Due to his laconic style, his poems were usually very short. He also wrote lyrics for songs that were sung in the symposiums. The most famous of them is the following. Gold is best tested by a whetstone heart, which gives a certain proof of purity. And gold itself acts as a test of men, by which we know the temper of their minds. His reputation spread all over Greece when a strategic prediction he once made came true. During his lifetime, he visited the island of Kythera, the only island owned by the Spartans. While he was there, he acknowledged its strategic importance and the fact that it was by far the most vulnerable location of the Spartan state. His remark was right because as the writer Diogenes says, if during the Greco-Persian wars, Xerxes had listened to the advice of the exiled Spartan Demaratus to gather all his ships at Kythera, then the Persians could have won the war. Diogenes also mentions that later, during the Peloponnesian War, the Athenians established a garrison at Kythera and inflicted great damage upon the Spartans. Chilon died at the age of 80 in the city of Pisa near Olympia in the Peloponnese. According to the sources, he passed away when overwhelmed with joy, he embraced and kissed his son after he won at the Olympics boxing match. All those that were present in the city at that time attended his funeral. After his death, the Spartans erected a statue of Chilon in the city with the following inscription. The warlike Sparta bore this man, Chilon, the wisest of all the seven sages. Pitacus was born in the city of Mytilene on the Greek island of Lesvos around 650 BC. Mytilene at that time was a powerful city-state with a strong navy and many colonies in the northwest of Anatolia. However, there was a political upheaval and civil strife for many years on the island. When Pitacus was still young, he led an uprising together with the brothers of Alcaeus, the famous poet, and overthrowed Melanchros, the tyrant of Lesvos. Later on, he joined the military and became the commander of the army. He distinguished himself when during a war between Athens and Mytilene, he challenged the Athenian commander Phrynon, an Olympic champion no less, to single combat and won by trapping him inside a fishing net and killing him. 
He later married a woman whose name is unknown from the family of Penthilide, the former ruling clan of the city. Allegedly, his wife always looked down on him because she was from an upper class. Around 590 BC, he was elected Asimnitis, a position similar to a dictator where he held absolute power, albeit given that power by the people. During Pitacus's rule, he introduced new laws and stabilized the state by quelling the warring political factions. According to the historian Pamphili, when his son was killed by a coppersmith, they brought the murderer in front of Pitacus, and after he listened to him, he let him go, saying, pardon is better than repentance. The philosopher Heraclitus, though, tells a different story. When the poet Alcaeus, who had become a political rival of Pitacus and was banished from the island, was captured, Pitacus let him go, saying, pardon is better than punishment. It is said that during his free time, Pitacus would write lyrics and poems, and in order to maintain physical health, he would often grind wheat. After ruling for 10 years, Pitacus retired. In order to honour him, the state of Mytilene gave him a great patch of land, but he devoted it to the gods and let it be. Pitacus died of old age around 580 BC. Upon his gravestone was the following inscription. Sacred Lesvos, who bore him here, with tears doth bury, wise Pitacus. Cleobulus was born around the early 6th century BC in the city of Lindos, the capital of the Greek island of Rhodes. Among the seven sages, he is the one whose life we know the least about. Most sources agree that he was the ruler of Lindos and that he made the city prosper by taking advantage of the position of the island as Rhodes was in the centre of the network of the Mediterranean sea routes. Thus, he established a lucrative trade, further strengthening the economic ties of the island with Egypt, the Levant, and the Near Eastern cultures. During his rule, he renovated the Temple of Athena at Lindos, a Panhellenic sanctuary which, according to legend, was first built during the early Mycenaean period. The sources describe him as a strong and elegant man. It is said that he studied philosophy in Egypt. He also frequently wrote songs and riddles. The most famous lyrics of his that were sung in the symposiums were the following. Ignorance and talkativeness bear the chief sway among people. Opportunity will be the most powerful. Cherish not a thought. Do not be fickle or ungrateful. At some point in his life, Cleobulus had a daughter and named her Cleobulina. When she grew up, she too wrote riddles like her father. According to Diogenes, Cleobulus believed that women should be just as educated as men, a remarkably progressive opinion for that time. Cleobulus died at the age of 70. Upon his gravestone, the following inscription was written. His homeland Lindos, this fair sea-girt city, bewails wise Cleobulus, here entombed. Among the seven wise men of ancient Greece was a man called Periander. In historiography, Periander is a very controversial figure, mostly because the sources often contradict each other regarding Periander's character and rule. 
so much so that it seemed like they are talking about two entirely different people. Periander, born in 650 BC, was the son of Kypsilus, the first tyrant of Corinth who established the Kypsilid dynasty. When his father died, Periander succeeded him as the tyrant of the city and then married Lycidae, the daughter of Proclus, the tyrant of Epidaurus. Together they had three children, two sons, Kypsilus and Nicophron, and a daughter whose name is not mentioned. According to Diogenes, the firstborn Kypsilus was incompetent, while the second son, Lycophron, was very wise. During his rule, Periander befriended Thrasybulus, the tyrant of Miletus, and Aliatis, the king of Lydia. And this is where the waters get muddy. On the one hand, the majority of the sources depict Periander as a brutal tyrant who abused his power and did whatever he could to remain in charge of the state. But on the other hand, there are sources in which he is depicted as an extremely competent ruler who made the city-state of Corinth prosper and paved the way for many technological and artistic developments. The primary source in which Periander is depicted in a negative light is the work of Herodotus. According to him, Periander, after hearing false rumours about his wife's unfaithfulness, he killed her in a fit of rage, only to deeply regret his action afterwards. When hearing about his beloved mother's death, Lycophron was furious with his father. Periander banished his son from Corinth and exiled him to the island of Corsaira, which was a Corinthian colony at that time. Later on, Herodotus even incorporates supernatural elements into the story. He claims that one day, when Periander was searching for a hidden treasure in the city, he sent messengers to the Oracle of the Dead in Epirus in order to learn about the treasure's location. According to the messengers, when they reached the Oracle, the ghost of Periander's wife appeared before them and told them that she knew the location of the treasure, but she would not reveal it. She told them that Periander, after burying her, neglected to burn her clothes, as was the custom, and now, without them, she was feeling cold in the underworld. In order to satisfy his wife's ghost, Periander thought of a malicious plan. He invited all the women of Corinth to the Temple of Hera. Thinking this would be a special occasion, the women went, dressed in their finest garments. When all of them entered the temple, they were ambushed by soldiers who stripped them naked and then burned their clothes. Now content, Periander's wife revealed to the messengers the location of the treasure. The Greek historian Ephorus gives a different account, less supernatural but still cruel, in which the women inside the temple were not stripped naked but were robbed of all their jewellery because Periander wanted to make a golden statue as an offering to the gods. According to Herodotus, in his old age, Periander chose to reconcile with his son Lycophron because he regarded him as the most capable among his sons and wished for him to succeed him. His son agreed to return to Corinth, but only if his father was to go to Corsaira in his place and stay there in exile. When the Corsairans heard about this, they ambushed and killed Lycophron in order to keep Periander away from the island. Periander was so enraged about the death of his son that he allegedly captured 300 young men from Corsaira and sent them to the king of Lydia in order to castrate them, wanting to inflict upon them the pain of losing their family line. However, during the journey to Lydia, when the ship arrived at the island of Samos, the young men sought refuge within a temple. Fortunately, the Samians came to their rescue, sparing them from their intended fate. This is the story of Periander as it was written by Herodotus. Besides Herodotus, there were other historians as well who portrayed Periander in a negative light. The writer Aristippus even claims that Periander had an incestuous relationship with his own mother. It is suggested that his cruelty towards others stemmed from his discomfort after the relationship was discovered. But as we mentioned, there were also scholars who portrayed Periander as a wise and very competent ruler. Among those were Plutarch and Aristotle. In fact, Plutarch, in his work The Malice of Herodotus, accuses Herodotus of being extremely biased, claiming that most of what he writes about Periander is clearly a myth. 
According to the more positive writers, Periander was responsible for transforming Corinth, making it one of the strongest city-states in Greece. They say that he continued the work of his father and established new colonies in Macedonia and Epirus, while also bringing order to the old Corinthian colony on the island of Corsaira. Moreover, it is said that during his rule, Corinth's first coinage was issued and the city's economy flourished. He established trade deals with South Italy, the Lydians and Egypt and he provided many new employment opportunities. It is mentioned that he wanted to build a canal on the Corinthian Isthmus so that the merchant and navy ships could cross from Corinthian waters to the Saronic Gulf. When he realized that this was not possible due to the limited technology of the time, he thought of another plan. He issued the construction of the Deal Kos, a limestone trackway built to transport boats across the Isthmus of Corinth. The trackway was around 6 meters wide and 7 kilometers long. The ships would be placed on a wheeled platform and would be transferred across from one port to the other. The Deal Kos was a very ambitious project for its time, as well as a tremendous technological feat. The Corinthians successfully substituted a journey of 700 kilometers through a treacherous sea with a mere 6 kilometer journey on land. This is without a doubt the greatest achievement that is attributed to Periander. Aside from the economic and technological advancements, these sources also tell us that Periander was a poet and a great patron of the arts. It is said that he often invited poets to the city and under his rule, Corinthian vase production and art flourished. Having heard both the negative and the positive narratives on Periander's rule, one can only wonder which one of them is true. What should be noted is that the first source on Periander dates 150 years after his death and the latest source dates 6 centuries later. If ancient Greek historians painted a quite similar picture of Periander, then the age gap would not have been much of an issue. However, that is not the case here. Even the accounts of his death vary. One source claims that he died of sorrow, while another claims that he ordered his men to kill him. However, it is fairly agreed upon that he died around 585 BC, having ruled Corinth for over 40 years. Upon his gravestone was the following inscription. The sea beat land of Corinth in her bosom, doth here embrace her ruler Periander, great for his wealth and wisdom. There is speculation that the image of Periander as a depraved tyrant who was so cruel that he even killed his own wife was created by the aristocratic families of Corinth who regained control of the city two years after Periander's death. It is reasonable to assume that they had a motive to distort his image, both because during his rule, Periander suppressed their power and influence and in order for the aristocrats to prevent future tyrant uprisings. It should be noted that tyranny did not have the same connotation it has today. In ancient Greece, a tyrant would often take power from the aristocrats by force. However, most of the time, he did so with the support of the people and usually ruled for the many not for the few. No matter the information we have on Periander's character, it is historically true that Corinth was a thriving city during the 6th century BC, though whether this was due to his rule or in spite of it is very difficult to answer. It could very well be that the truth actually lies in between, like in many instances in historiography where there are two opposing points of view. But if Periander was such a controversial figure in later times, how come he was considered one of the seven sages of ancient Greece? Well, strangely enough, there were many scholars, among them Plato and Heraclides, who claimed that there were actually two Perianders. The first was the tyrant of Corinth, and the other one was a man from Ambracia, a city in the region of Epirus. They say that Periander from Ambracia was actually the wise man and Periander of Corinth was included in the seven sages instead of him because of a misunderstanding. Unfortunately, we know next to nothing about the Ambracian Periander, however, the claims of these scholars should not be easily dismissed. Some of the quotes that are attributed to Periander of Corinth, like democracy is better than tyranny, do not really make sense to have come from him.
at the end of the day, for the common people of ancient Greece, it did not really matter. They just knew that a man called Periander was among the seven sages and they admired him for the quotes that were attributed to him without knowing anything about his character or the contradicting sources about his rule. Thales, one of the seven sages of ancient Greece, and probably the most renowned one, is regarded as the first Greek philosopher, scientist, astronomer, and mathematician. He was born in the city-state of Miletus around the year 624 BC. Miletus was a Greek port city located in the region of Ionia in modern-day Turkey. During the time of Thales, Miletus flourished as a bustling trade hub and stood among the strongest Greek city-states boasting a powerful economy, a formidable army, and an impressive network of over 70 colonies, the majority of which were established along the shores of the Black Sea. Most of the sources indicate Thales as a native Greek, however there are two sources which propose a Phoenician lineage and there is also a source which suggests his affiliation with the Carian tribe, a people that lived east of Ionia and were assimilated into Greek culture. Whatever his ancestral origin was, Thales was born into an aristocratic family and was a proud militian. There is also a disagreement among the sources regarding the occupation of Thales. According to some of them, he was a trader, while according to others, he was an engineer. Thales was known for his ingenuity and intellect. From a young age, he became interested in the nature of things. He would study the world around him, always eager to gain knowledge. None of his works survive today, if indeed he ever wrote anything down, as there is speculation that he may have solely imparted his knowledge through oral teachings. What we know about Thales comes from scholars like Aristotle, Herodotus, Diogenes, Plato and others. Thales is regarded as the first Greek scientist because he was the first to try to explain natural phenomena by scientific means and not supernatural ones. He did not believe that earthquakes were caused by Poseidon, neither that thunderstorms occurred because of Zeus's anger. However, it is not known if Thales completely rejected the gods or not. He may have been religious in his own way, as it is said that at one time, in order to celebrate a new discovery of his, he sacrificed a bull to the gods. According to Aristotle, Thales believed that water was the archi, the originating principle of the universe and the nature of all things. He believed that all things came into being from water and ultimately returned to the originating material. Although we know today that this is not true, we can see why it made sense to Thales at that time. Thales always liked to observe nature and he noticed that during the cycle of water it took three different forms, solid, liquid and vapour. Additionally, as Thales noticed, water is ubiquitous, essential for the survival of both people and animals, and it serves as a vital source of nourishment for the earth. This theory of Thales was the first attempt to explore the fundamental substance of the universe, and it paved the way for the emergence of many different theories afterwards. 200 years later, it was Democritus who formulated the theory that the matter of the universe is composed by atoms. Thales was also deeply interested in studying the sky and the stars, which is why he is often referred to as the first Greek astronomer. One of his significant contributions was advising Greek sailors to use the constellation of Ursa Minor as their guide instead of the Ursa Major. The Ursa Minor has a smaller apparent orbit than the Ursa Major, which means it undergoes less positional changes in the sky compared to the Ursa Major. Thales had extensive knowledge of astronomy to the point that, according to some sources, he was able to predict a solar eclipse. 
Although we do not know the method he used, the date of the eclipse has been confirmed through modern scientific analysis, pinpointing it to 28 of May, 585 BC. At one point in his life, Thales visited Egypt and took up residence in the royal palace, immersing himself in the teachings of the Egyptian priests. It was during his time there that Thales received instruction in geometry, a subject of great importance to the Egyptians due to its significant role in the management and cultivation of the Nile. Thales made important contributions to early geometry as he is attributed with five basic propositions with proofs and two theorems. It is said that while he was in Egypt, Thales measured the height of the pyramids, a feat that had remained unaccomplished until then. According to Pliny, Thales discovered how to obtain the height of the pyramids and all other similar objects, namely by measuring the shadow of the object at the time when a body and its shadow are equal in length. Thales is also generally credited with advancing mathematics from a pragmatic way of thinking to a more theoretical approach. During the middle years of his life, Thales established the renowned Milesian school, where he engaged in teaching and delved into discussions concerning natural philosophy and mathematics. One of his first pupils was the philosopher Anaximander, who later formulated his own distinctive theories, diverging from those proposed by Thales. In addition to his scientific and philosophical pursuits, Thales had a keen interest in politics, actively engaging in political matters alongside his scholarly endeavours. At a certain point, Thales is said to have dissuaded his fellow citizens from forming an alliance with the king of Lydia against the Persians. As a result of his counsel, Meletus managed to escape the repercussions of Cyrus and the Persians following Croesus' defeat. Regarding his personal life, we know next to nothing about it. While some sources suggest that he was married and had a child, others claim that he never married and remained childless. Thales died at the age of 78 or 90, depending on the source, due to a sunstroke while he was watching the Olympic Games. Upon his gravestone was the following inscription. You see, this tomb is small, but recollect, the fame of Thales reaches the skies. One of the greatest of the seven sages of ancient Greece was a man called Solon. Solon was born in Athens in the year 640 or 638 BC. He was from a noble family from the island of Salamis, which allegedly traced its ancestry back to the hero Codrus. According to legends, Codrus was the last king of Athens who sacrificed himself for the good of the city. Although Solon's family was held in high esteem, it did not possess vast amounts of wealth and large fields like the rest of the aristocratic families. At a young age, a restless Solon, seeking both wealth and adventure, became a merchant sailor. For many years, he sailed the seas and journeyed all around the eastern Mediterranean, coming in contact with many different cultures. When he settled home, he had made a great wealth for himself, but more importantly, he had gained great knowledge from all his travels. After his return to Athens, he became quite interested in poetry and over time started writing political, patriotic and elegiac poems. Solon would often recite these poems himself at the Agora and various other public gatherings in Athens. During that time, the Athenian city-state was in a really bad shape. One of its main problems was the long drawn-out war between Athens and the nearby city-state of Megara. These two fought over ownership of the island of Salamis. During the year 600 BC, Salamis was in the hands of the Megarians, but both city-states were exhausted from the conflict. 
At that time, the Athenian government passed a law which prohibited the public discussion of the war between these two cities under pain of death. This was done in order to avoid any reignitement of the conflict. Solon, who was exceedingly patriotic to his city-state and who had a special bond with Salamis since it was where his family was from, decided he had to take action, and so he thought of a plan. He pretended he went crazy so as to avoid punishment, wore an olive wreath, burst into the agora and then started reading one of his patriotic poems, urging the Athenians to take up arms and claim Salamis. With his speech, he fired up the people and ignited a patriotic wave all over Athens. The Athenian government was unable to contain the masses, and so they made Solon the fleet commander and subsequently went to war with Megara. The Athenians succeeded in retaking Salamis, and Solon returned to Athens a champion, gaining great popularity. Until then, he was known for his wisdom, but after the war, the Athenians had also acknowledged his leadership capabilities. Despite the great victory though, the state of Athens was falling apart from the inside. The early 6th century BC had been a time of great political and social upheaval in all of Greece, but Athens probably had it worse than everyone else. In order to understand this topic, let's take a look at the Athenian politics of the time. During the year 600 BC, Athens was an oligarchic state, meaning that only members of aristocratic families were able to hold positions of authority and rule the state. At the top of the government were nine men. There was the eponymous or chief archon, along with a council of six junior or lesser archons, the polemarch, and finally the basileus. Oddly enough, all these men together comprised what the Athenians called the council of the nine archons. The eponymous Archon had the most important role as he was the one who administrated the Athenian state. The lesser Archons would aid the eponymous Archon and would enforce his decision. The Polemarch was the commander of the army and the one who oversaw the training of the Athenian hoplites. Finally, the Basileus, or king in ancient Greek, was a leftover title from the period of the monarchy. Although the monarchy had been abolished in Athens centuries ago, the title of Basileus was preserved due to its symbolism. The new Basileus was in charge of religious festivals and sacrifices. Originally, the nine archons held the positions for life, but in time, this diminished into a one-year term as more and more aristocrats wanted a share in power. The nine archons were elected by the Areopagus, which was a council of elders comprised of former archons. The members of the Areopagus would maintain the positions for life. In short, it was a system by the aristocrats and for the aristocrats, since the Areopagus elders would always elect members of their own family as archons. One of the main problems with this type of government was that the noble families would often fight one another for the place of the chief archon, and there were also instances where the chief archon would refuse to step down after his term had ended. These problems were present in many city-states across ancient Greece at that time. In fact, some of these conflicts between the aristocratic families would often escalate into full-blown civil wars. To counteract this, many of the city-states created a new position called the tyrant. During a period of political unrest, they would elect a tyrant to whom absolute power was given. The tyrant was expected to suppress the conflict, stabilize the state and subsequently relinquish power after a year. However, in many cases, the tyrant would refuse to give up his power or would resort to seizing it forcefully, often with the aid of the common people. In regards to Athens, aristocratic factionalism may have been a big problem, but it was not the most crucial one. In most city-states, since the aristocrats were the only ones who were able to rule, they often ignored the problems of the ordinary citizens. In Athens, they didn't just ignore their problems, they completely neglected them. During the beginning of the 6th century BC, Athens had grown so much that it was barely able to feed itself. The small farmers, who comprised the majority of the Athenian population, were buried in debt. The aristocrats would exploit this situation by buying those farmers' lands extremely cheap and making them work in the fields for a very small pay. In time, more and more people were indebted for life to the aristocrats. 
The only way for someone to avoid this was to secure a loan in the hopes of someday paying his debt. But a poor farmer could only offer himself and sometimes his own family as collateral. If they failed to pay the loan, they would be sold as slaves either to other Athenian citizens or abroad in other city-states. As a result, half of the farmers had become serfs in their own former lands or had become actual slaves. This situation was tearing Athens apart and the people were ready to revolt. And this is where Solon comes along. The aristocrats, in order to avoid an uprising of the people, a civil war or the rise of a tyrant, decided to elect Solon as chief archon and gave him free reign to change the constitution. He was chosen as a mediator specifically because he was neither a revolutionary nor part of the elite since although he was of noble birth, he did not associate himself with the members of the aristocratic families. Solon began by erasing all debts, thereby relieving the majority of the citizens of their burdens. He made the first example by erasing the debt owed to his father. On top of that, he set free all those who had been enslaved due to debt and forbade from that day onward the enslavement of an Athenian by a fellow Athenian. Solon then decided to change the administrative system. First, he changed the qualifications for the position of the nine archons from noble birth to wealth. Although the aristocrats were not very happy with this decision, it did not enrage them since all of them were already very wealthy and therefore still eligible to rule. By doing this, Solon made the administrative council much more inclusive since there were many wealthy people, mainly traders, who were not of noble birth and so the monopoly of the aristocracy was broken. In addition, Solon created the Athenian General Assembly in which every citizen was included. The people at the assembly would vote for any important political and social matter and would also elect the council of the nine archons. Additionally, Solon restructured the Athenian class system, dividing the people into four groups and ranked them according to their wealth. He also created a council of 400 men called the Bouli, in which each of the four classes appointed 100 men. The Bouli was in charge of choosing which matters would be brought to a vote in the General Assembly. Thus, the power of the Areopagus diminished significantly, although it did oversee important trials involving accusations like treason and murder. Meanwhile, among all the other problems, Athens was facing a large food shortage. In order to combat this, Solon banned the export of food products except olives and olive oil since those were plentiful in the region of Attica. Additionally, following the erasure of the debts, the economy was in shambles. As a solution, Solon decided to mint the first Athenian coins and helped in facilitating their circulation. Solon's next move was to reform the lords of the city-state. Prior to that point, Athens had abided by Draco's law code, which was infamous for its severity even by the standards of the time. Solon made the law system much more lenient, although he did keep the death sentence for crimes like murder. Furthermore, he also enacted reforms that enhanced the equality of the law for the common people. From then on, every citizen was equal before the law. Well, at least in theory. Solon's new laws covered a wide array of matters such as theft, adultery, inheritance and property damage. He had them carved in stone and displayed them outside of the assembly. Unfortunately, only fragments of his laws survive today. While the reforms of Solon were instrumental in stabilizing the state, there were still many challenges to face. On the one hand, the aristocrats were becoming increasingly resentful of Solon after realizing the extent to which their power had diminished. But on the other hand, the common people were demanding further reforms like the redistribution of the land. Furthermore, despite his economic reforms, a large percentage of the Athenians were still struggling to make ends meet. Due to these issues, Solon found himself constantly visited by individuals seeking changes, explanations for his laws, and even the restoration of old legislation. Solon, after many years of ruling, decided to give up his power. 
But before he did so, he made the Athenians swear an oath that they would uphold his laws for either 10 or 100 years, depending on the source. Solon left Athens and began travelling around the eastern Mediterranean once again. His first stop was in Egypt, where he met the pharaoh Amasis II and the two high priests, Senephis and Sonkis, who, according to Plato, told him the tale of the lost civilization of Atlantis. Next, he went to Lydia, where he met with Croesus, its great king. During the reign of Croesus, Lydia was at its highest point of power and prosperity, and Croesus himself was an enormously rich man. According to Herodotus, Croesus invited Solon to his palace and showed him his wealth and treasures. After the tour of the palace ended, Croesus asked Solon, O oh, stranger of Athens, we have heard much of your wisdom and of your travels through many lands from love of knowledge and a wish to see the world. I am curious, therefore, to inquire of you, whom of all the men that you have seen do you deem the most happy? And Solon answered, Tell us the Athenian, sire. Croesus was shocked as he expected to hear his own name and demanded to know why did he deem this Tellus of Athens the happiest man. Then Solon answered, First, because his country was flourishing in his days, and he himself had sons both beautiful and good, and he lived to see children born to each of them, and these children all grew up. And further, because after a life spent in what our people look upon as comfort, his end was surpassingly glorious. In a battle between the Athenians and their neighbours near Elysis, he came to the assistance of his countrymen, routed the foe, and died upon the field most gallantly. The Athenians gave him a public funeral on the spot where he fell, and paid him the highest honours. Croesus then asked who, after Tellus, seemed to him the most happiest, expecting that, at any rate, he would be given the second place. But Solon answered again, without flattery. Cleobis and Beto, sire, the two young men were noted for their filial devotion to their mother and for their athletic prowess and strength. They died in their prime, surrounded by the praise and love of their family and fellow citizens at Delphi, who would honour their memory forever. After hearing this, Croesus replied with anger, What stranger of Athens is my happiness then, so utterly set at naught by you, that you do not even put me on the same level as common men? Solon then replied, For yourself, O Croesus, I see that you are wonderfully rich, and you are the lord of many nations. But with respect to your question, I have no answer to give until I hear that you have closed your life happily. For assuredly, he who possesses great store of riches is no nearer happiness than he who has what suffices for his daily needs, unless it so happens that luck attends upon him, and so he continues in the enjoyment of all his good things to the end of his life. For many of the wealthiest men have been unfavoured of fortune, and many whose means were moderate have had excellent luck. You should count no man happy until you know the full extent of his life. His answer did not please Croesus at all, and he asked Solon to depart from his palace. But soon after, Croesus was met with misfortune after misfortune. First, his eldest son was killed while hunting, and then Cyrus, the king of kings, the leader of the Achaemenid Empire, along with his army, conquered his kingdom, besieged the capital, and captured Croesus. The Persians built a great pyre, bound the Lydian king to it, and set it on fire. As the flames were rising up, Croesus then remembered the words of the Athenian sage, and he cried out, Solon, O oh Solon! Cyrus listened to this and ordered his men to set Croesus free from the pyre. He then asked him who was this Solon, to which Croesus answered, One I would give much to see converse with every monarch. And as Croesus explained to Cyrus the whole story, the king of kings was so moved that he allowed Croesus to live and later made him his counsellor. Solon, after leaving Lydia, continued his journey into Cilicia, a region in the south of Anatolia. Finally, he settled in Cyprus, where he was given the administration of a city by the local king. While Solon was away, tensions in Athens were rising once again, and political strife was brewing in the city. 
Four or five years after his departure, Solon's laws fell into disuse and three opposing factions had risen. The faction of the plain, which was comprised mainly of aristocrats, the coastal faction comprised mostly of traders, and the hill faction comprised mostly of shepherds and poor farmers. The leader of the hill faction was Pisistratus, a distant cousin of Solon. Pisistratus took the power by force and became the tyrant of Athens. Despite taking the power with forceful means, his rule was fairly just. He upheld most of the laws of Solon and protected the common people. Now, the sources disagree on what Solon did after Pisistratus claimed power. Some say that he never returned to Athens from his journey. Others say that he came back and tried to abolish the tyranny, but he failed to do so and so he went into self-exile. And finally, there are those who claim that Solon returned to the city and cooperated with Pisistratus for a time, instructing him on how to rule the state. By that time, however, he was an old man. Most sources agree that Solon died in Cyprus at the age of 80. He was cremated and his ashes were scattered around the island of Salamis. Engraved on his statue in Athens was the following inscription. The island of Salamis that halted the Median insolence brought forth this holy lawgiver, wise Solon. Solon gained his rightful place among the seven sages. He was remembered as a leader, a commander, a lawgiver, a poet, but most importantly as a reformer, as it was his reforms that paved the way for the establishment of Athenian democracy decades after his death. The Athenian citizens would revere him and would study his laws and poems during all of antiquity. The introduction of the seven sages as esteemed and revered figures brought about a transformation in the culture and identity of ancient Greece, since the maxims of the sages embodied and expressed the social norms and cultural values of the ancient Greek society. The most famous maxims of each sage were carved upon the entrance of the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. They helped uphold ancient Greek tradition and cultural values. In time, these maxims resonated far and wide as the Greeks ventured across various lands. During the Hellenistic period around the 4th century BC, where Greek culture was spreading to a large part of Asia, a Greek man from Thessaly known as Clearchus established a city in the extremities of the Macedonian Empire, which today is known as Ai Kanum. Remarkably, a stele was found in a building called the Heron of Cineus, bearing the inscribed maxim of one of the seven sages. In childhood, be well behaved. In youth, have self-control. In middle age, behave justly. In old age, be of wise counsel. In death, be without sorrow. Clearchus, the founder of the city himself, wrote next to the maxim, the wise words of men of old, words of celebrated men, are set up in most holy Delphi. From there, Clearchus copied them meticulously and had them drawn up, brilliant from afar, in the Heron of Cineus. Even today, sayings such as know thyself and nothing in excess continue to remain popular. Thank you.